Hey everybody, John Grimsmo here. Our air conditioning is going in today. It's coming in right in that window. Let's go check it out. My wife did a pretty good job on my haircut. This is crazy. Look at the size of that. Look at the size of that. So the original plan was to bring it and just come in right through this wall. And then kind of come in there and then out or whatever. But our landlord didn't want us, you know, busting a hole in that wall. So we decided to go in through that. Just this window right there, that window is going to stay. So the guys are up there right now putting in the ducting work and their, their sheet metal skills are impressive. So there's no window in here right now. But hopefully by the end of the day they should have this buttoned up. Angelo's been running the Nakamura hard making these Saga pen tubes. The tube in there. Um, we used to buy tubing but we didn't like it that much. There were a lot of issues and problems with that. So now we're drilling solid bar with a long uh, OSG drill bit doing like 10 or 12 times D, like uh, depth times diameter. Um, and it's going great. It's going super duper good. And right now we're doing one at a time because we don't have a good way to eject the part without scratching it or, or causing a problem or actually we don't have a spring loaded way to eject it right now because it's such a long part. You need a long spring travel. But thanks to a uh, a listener to our podcast who emailed and, and gave a really good suggestion. Um, we've got a, a plan in motion that should be, should be working by about next week, by Monday. So that will allow us to make automated like many, many, many pen bodies at a time. So that's good. In other good news, like I said, I haven't filmed much in the past two weeks, but I've been very, very busy. These two machines turned on yesterday. So yesterday we had a Heidenheim technician come in, an expert, and uh, let me give both my hands here. So we had the Heidenheim expert come in and just work his magic. He's been, he's been working on Heidenheim forever, basically. And he actually looked in the hard drive of that machine. He looked in the back and he's like, oh, the computer's not seeing the hard drive. So he looked at the hard drive and there's handwriting on it. And he goes, that's my handwriting from 2011 on this machine. Where, where was this machine before? So I gave him the history of it and everything. And he goes, yeah, I think I replaced this hard drive back then. Um, so yeah, there were some PLC problems on both machines and some, uh, there's a BIOS battery. Like you know how a computer has a, has a BIOS battery, a little CR2030, 2032 I think? These ones have a similar thing, except they're fatter and they're called a uh, 2450N. So it's like, it's like two of the ones put together. Um, both of these were dead in both these machines because I've owned them for a year and they've been sitting um, and they've been sitting for quite a bit before that so but yeah he said replacing these didn't have to do parameter backup or anything like it all just worked within four hours he was in and out and done and so I should have done this five months ago when we first moved in um, now I've got another company coming in to do uh, repair and overhaul and they're going to do like a hundred point inspection and change the oils and check everything and make sure the tool changer works and all that stuff. So they should be coming in the next few days and I'm super duper duper excited because I, I have a lot of I have a lot of hope and faith in these very used machines. They're from 2002 um, and I got them used for a really good price and it's that gamble. It's like we've got new machines everywhere else. This is a big gamble for used machines but I think I think we can get them to work. I think we can make them do exactly what we want. Uh, they have a really good platform for, for the needs that we have for uh, secondary milling machines. So next couple days, we'll, we'll start to get more updates on that. Uh, check this out. Angelo found this online and sent it to me and thought it'd be a good idea. This is a, I don't know what you call it, Trimaco Easy Floor Guards. Uh, it's a shoe protector because we've got really nice floors and we've got a lot of contractors coming in and out now, electricians and AC guys and everything. And we don't want to track in all the garbage from outside and scratch up our floors. So this is a, it's, they're adhesive pads, stuck to my hand already. Um, I'm going to waste one for the sake of science for the, for the video here and I'll show you guys. Uh, there's some downsides though that we don't love about it. Okay, 
So now this piece of plastic is stuck to the bottom of my shoe. Um, especially around the lapping machine, we track that black garbage from, from the lapping machine, the, the oily, what do you call it, the sludge, basically. And, and there ends up being footsteps around the shop, even as clean as we try to be. So this was for the contractors and for the lapping machine. Except the downside that we found is that after a couple steps, um, not so much on my shoe right now, but the adhesive stays on your shoe. And then you're just walking around sick and everything for a while. And maybe it's maybe it's more perception than it is an actual problem, because I guess that adhesive would just wear off after you know so many steps. So maybe it's not a big, big deal, but um, yeah, some of the guys didn't like it because it really, the, the glue stayed on your shoe. Uh, maybe I'll leave this on my shoe for a little bit and see what it see what it does. So it's one of those like it's not a clear winner, but we'll see. And it's still grippy enough. It's a little tiny bit slipperier on my foot, but the uh, issue that I had two two days ago of milling the Torx pattern and having those weird dots totally fixed. Um, yeah, I, I forget if I I think I explained it in the last video. I made the adaptive tool path deeper and I just cut through any of those dots and then they're good now. Swiss has been running for a couple days now, perfect, making great parts. Um, I did break one of those corner radius tools after about 450 parts, which is earlier than I was hoping for because they're a lot more expensive. So I don't know if I'm in love with those yet, but yeah. I know a lot of you guys are drooling for a Rask update and I'll get to that. I'll feed you baby birds, just not yet. Um, yesterday, I made this. Isn't that beautiful? Titanium. Um, Eric asked for one of these. The old one we had was aluminum. Let's go over to the other shop and I'll show you what it does. So I made this on the Kern um, out of one solid block and uh, it's just, it doesn't need to be this pretty, but I am so glad that I made it this pretty. pretty happy with it and it's I don't know I, I get super duper picky sometimes like uh, need a pointing device like in this finish you can see horizontal streaks and that's just due to the quality like the the life of the end mill the quality the end mill that I did with this um, was a used end mill and I've been beating it up for quite a long time this is actually really nice there's not a lot of bad streaks in there and as you'll see for this part, it do not matter. But as I get picky with the parts that I make, I, I look at all these little things. You can see here a little swirl. There's a couple others. Like that little guy right there. On this part, it doesn't matter, but I, I'm, not, I'm not just trying to make one good parts at a time. I'm trying to increase my skill and my ability to see things and my ability to avoid doing those problems so that when I do have a critical job, something that I need to make that needs to look perfect, perfect, perfect. I have the skill, I know how to do it. I know how to make the machine dance and make it do what I want it to do. So yeah, let's go to the front building and I'll show you what this is for. By the way, I don't know if you guys saw Peter McKinnon's video that just uh, dropped a couple days ago. Oh, it was good. It was so much fun to have him here. It's a great video. Link here somewhere. Fraser's gonna put that up. Uh, watch it, it's, it's really, really good. Stop watching this, watch that, come back to this, keep watching this. They have to replace this door. They promised they would replace this door, the landlords. We'll get them. So this fixture is replacing this fixture that we made a long time ago. We actually made this for DLC coating so that we could put parts in it and send it to DLC and they could, they could hold the parts well. Um, see what it does. We're putting our Norseman pivots in there right now, screwed in from both sides and then we throw it in the tumbler. It gives it that tumbled finish on the face because we weren't a million percent happy with the turned finish coming off the Swiss with the tooling and everything that exactly that I was using, so we figured we'd just tumble it. But as you can see, this fixture has, has seen its days and uh, Sky actually realized that it's caused problems on some of the finishes because a lot of times, like this new Starburst pattern, uh, he'll anodize it one color and then he'll put it in the tumbler for a couple minutes or whatever, scrub off some of the high colors or even sometimes for a long time 
and then um, anodize it again, you get this two-tone effect. It's super duper cool. But what we found out was for an uh, aluminum fixture, if this is in the tumbler at the same time, scratching against the titanium will leave like, a, like an aluminum smudge that doesn't anodize properly. And then we have this spot in our knives that like drives us crazy because we're like, I don't know what it's from. It's from this. So the guys requested that we make one out of titanium and uh, it should solve that problem completely. What I didn't realize, it's got less holes. Eric was just walking around looking for the handle. I was just holding it, showing you guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's like, where is it? <laughs> I'm so confused. The real test, will a pivot fit? Okay, good. Oh, mm. I might have to ream these holes bigger. I didn't think about something. It fits, but it's tight. And then the two holes on the end, like he's got here, are for the zip ties. What are the zip, zip ties for, Eric? Uh, without them, a nice big flat surface like this will just glue itself to the side, like on the wall. You like suction cup it. Yeah, and then like one side will get tumbled and the other side will get kind of like weirdly polished. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so yeah, it's just to keep it rolling. What do they do in though? The tumbler. They just uh, the stones will grab these and kind of like keep it pulling around. You do it for all the knife handles too, yeah, right? All the handles, all the blades, uh, basically everything we try to attach uh, a zip tie to. And then it's also easier to find it and pull it out uh, when you see it. Yeah. It's our secret zip tie trick that's not a secret that somebody else told us about. Yeah. <laughs> like bread? Yeah. yeah. But it, it works. It works great. Mm -hmm. So check this out. So this guy's over here doing anodizing for our knife parts. Some parts there, some saga parts, some pen parts on the bench over there. And we've got these four uh, Home Depot buckets that are uh, used for the anodizing setup. Um, what is each one? I wrote it on the lids, but you can add yeah, five. Yeah, rear inch two, rear inch one. There you go. And up, which has two scoops of baking soda, and then your post rinse. And then this one that I'm setting up now is multi-edge. Yes. We've had old, old multi-edge, which he actually just disposed of properly. Um, and we just got a new batch of multi-edge. We haven't really used it much, but this fresh stuff, maybe we'll get awesome results out of it. Okay. Um, what I wanted to say, Sky and I were just talking about this yesterday. He hates the orange buckets yeah. because you can't see the color properly of what you're doing. So next time I'm at the store, I'll get some white buckets. And uh, I see Eric nodding his head over there. <laughs> like I've always thought about putting LED lights or something around it, like make it right inside there so you can actually see what's going on. Uh, maybe we'll put a top light up here so we get some better light. This is what I was actually looking for. Yeah. What kind of are those? Okay. Here's multi-edge rinse water. I love that these are like very old. Check it out, air conditioning, almost done. Front building AC. So the next project I've been working on uh, is in that blue box right down there. This is something I've wanted to do for years, literally. And now we finally have the opportunity to go full Grimsmo on it. And I'm really excited to get it going. size of this thing. This is a Grunfos, what do you call it, uh, M, M something something 35? MQ3-35 pump. So it's a water pump and or coolant pump. Um, and what's really cool is it holds line pressure. So anything after the pump, like say you have the pump hooked up to a garden hose spray nozzle, that pump will hold line pressure because uh, it's got its own little bladder. And the second you crack open that pump, it turns on again as necessary, so it holds your, holds your pressure. So 
you don't have to like wait for it to repressurize or anything like that. Um, so we are building out a somewhat elaborate uh, coolant filling station for all of the machines. Because right now we have one, two, three, and soon to be four CNC machines that will need coolant and need top up all the time. And uh, the, the water in the coolant evaporates with the heat and the, and the humidity and it adds to the humidity. Air conditioning, I guess, is gonna help with that quite a bit, but it still evaporates quite a lot and quite often, especially the Mori that's running like every day right there um, so yeah this is my plan super cool uh, we got an IBC container that big guy right over the, there we got right here in this box we have a reverse osmosis water system from US water uh, spent a ton of time trying to learn about water quality and reverse osmosis or deionized water or both and I settled on just reverse osmosis is what we need for our system. We're not plumbing up the entire shop and all the sinks and all the bathrooms and everything with our water because our water here is fine. Like my buddies in Texas were saying that um, their water is so bad and so hard that rinsing a titanium part will leave water spots on the part. So he just spent like 10,000 plus on a, a complete reverse osmosis system for his shop. This only cost me about 500 US. The pump was uh, a thousand, almost a thousand Canadian, 900 Canadian. And I'm, I'm certainly dropping some coin on many different things here. Um, but yeah, I, we'll probably do our own like separate project video on that, but I'll give you a quick little overview of that now. And uh, yeah, what I want is I want like, Long-term goals, I want autofill everything. I know how to do it, I know it's possible, I know how to put the safety checks in place if there's a spill or something. Solenoids, moisture sensors. Uh, you don't even need to go complicated with Arduino or anything. It's, it's all fairly uh, straightforward. And I know that's possible. So for now, at least, I just want water at every machine. I want premix out the garden hose at every machine so that we can fill on demand, we don't have to carry buckets around, we don't have to mix anything. The Mixtron unit that we have mixes the, the water and the coolant automatically, and um, it works really well, but right now it's stuck in the corner, or we're, we're lugging it around on a 55 gallon barrel. I don't want that, I just want a coolant gun at every machine so we can top up as necessary, and then eventually automate that with float levels in each tank, and a Mixtron on each unit, on each machine, so that each machine gets its own concentration, and. I don't know, I could talk for days about this because I've literally been doing dozens of hours of research on this over the past many, many months. And uh, yeah, it's something I'm, I'm excited to implement. It's gonna be awesome because constantly filling machines and topping them up every day is just, I'm over it. It's, I don't even do it anymore because the guys do it for me, but it's still, it's done. It, it's not happening anymore. We're gonna make that easier so that the guys can focus on more critical tasks. They can use their brains more, uh, yeah. Yeah, there's some, a uh, little bit of complicated electronics that I'm putting into this system too for safeties and float sensors and stuff like that. I'm excited. So something I noticed over the past few weeks is, and maybe I've always done this, but I really noticed it now because, especially because I didn't film and I was filming super a lot before, I think I go through periods of time when I get super duper creative and just want to create new things and invent things and solve problems and, and do this and do that and do that. And then I kind of get phased out of that and then I want to get super duper productive and just get stuff done and make progress and, and finish all those projects that I just went creative on. And I, I feel it because the past two weeks has been that creative time period. I've, I've invented so many new things. I've got two new products that I want to bring to market. Um, and I work them out in my head every night. I go for a walk and I just think about those things. And um, I made really good progress on one of them that I've been working on for a very long time. And, you know, working on the cooling system and working on some 3D printer stuff. And yes, I know, I know it's taken me away from Rask's, but I needed the break. And I, my brain needs to work in this creative and then productive, and then creative and then productive. And hey, it, it, I'm still trying to figure stuff out. I'm still trying to figure out how I work best and to honestly be okay with how I work best and not like judge myself too hard. But I have to set the systems in place 
so that it still gets done like like the work and the the requirements and everything that that has to get done still gets done that's why we're growing a team and you know having people on on staff that like can actually do stuff so I don't have to do stuff anymore um, and allow allows me the freedom to grow and work on the business and you know take us in the direction that I want to go um, so it's a lot of self-reflective lately and, and always that's just how I live but yeah, it's, it's cool, it's, I'm almost okay with it. To be like, okay, you know, this is clearly a creative period of time when my brain just won't shut off and all I wanna do is different stuff and new stuff and, and dive deep into those things, but figure them out. And I'm, I'm, I can feel myself transitioning out of that phase. I'm getting less creative the past few days and I'm, I'm rip and ready to go. I wanna finish <coughs> all of those projects that I created the past two weeks. So I feel like the next two weeks, it's going to be, I don't know if it's a two and two, but the next period of time is going to be a, uh, I've got a lot of cool stuff to do. Cool stuff and productive stuff, and I want to have Rasks done. I know I said that like three weeks ago, but um, I did make progress in the past two weeks, just not, not, they're not done yet. So. It's holding up pretty good. It's probably been 45 minutes or so, walking around and stuff. It's still still fully there um, hasn't fallen off yet so I haven't peeled it off later today I'll just leave it on for a while later today I'll peel it off and see if the glue sticks hey guys so I had to run last night I couldn't film anymore so today is part two with a different t-shirt uh, what are we at Tuesday today anyway air conditioning guys did a killer job look at this ducting right there let's go take a look almost done how cool is that? So this is the return air. It's gonna suck shop air, feed it back to the unit. The unit's gonna make it cold and it's gonna duct it out those two ports a couple different directions. That's some monster stuff. So last week, I think I mentioned, I think I mentioned at the end of one of my vlogs that when I was making this top plate fixture, I made the screw hole head holes wrong. They needed to be deeper and then I cut them again and I accidentally mounted it just ever so slightly crooked, but I'm exaggerating now. I mounted it crooked and the tool comes in and screwed the whole thing up. So today I'm busting out another one of these. Um, and let's make it right this time. So I just got the machine warmed up, ready to run the code and uh, cut that little chunk of material right there. While I'm still getting more and more comfortable with this machine, um, I find it's helpful to turn the coolant off for the first few seconds of the code so that I know I know what's going on. I know the tool is going to go to where I say it's going to go, where I think it's going to go. Because programming is it's very straightforward. I mean, it's hard, but it's, it's cause and effect. You tell it to do this, the machine's supposed to do that. So I like to have that checks and balances to make sure the machine is doing what I think it's going to do, uh, that I didn't get something wrong, that I didn't make a mistake, didn't forget to touch off a tool, etc. So. Um, sometimes I just like that, but I've always liked that for years. I like that little sanity check. Just watching the tool, usually I'll pause it like this high above the surface and be like, does that look like half an inch? It says half an inch, it looks like half an inch. Okay, we're good to go. So, yeah, so that's gonna run for, I don't know, about half an hour or so. And uh, it should be good, because I ran it before, I just did a couple tweaks, that's all. It's actually only 20 minutes for these operations. You kind of see what's going on here. Some various drilling and end milling and some precision bores for locating the profile, face the top, basic stuff. And then we bring it over to Camplete and Camplete tells us the machine's gonna be good and all the code is good. There's a couple minor tiny errors, um, but livable stuff that I understand. So, quick update on the, that uh, shoe, the sticky stuff that goes in the bottom of the shoe. Um, so I had it on my shoe all day, all night, and then uh, this morning I picked it off at home. And a lot of it, come on. There we go. <laughs> um, a lot of the glue still stayed, and now I've got a lot of sticky stuff sticking to the shoe, and it, it is kind of annoying. I thought at first it would just kind of like, uh, get rid of itself as you walk around a little bit, but it's not and it's picking up garbage and dust and hair and smuts and stuff And it's leaving these kind of uh, 
stains, like not stains, like this one comes off easily. I had I had one by the Swiss lathe that I put there today that uh, did not come off easily, and it was really annoying actually. So I'm I'm not sold. I'm not in love with those, especially for our situation, for our floors and stuff. But um, yeah, not sure what to do with that. I, I love trying out those theories though to see if they if they pan out if they work. That's the experimentation process. Um, but yeah, keep our eyes open. It's, let me show you the bigger reason why. Um, I think I mentioned this before, like, but the lapping machine is it's just got this black diamond goo that just kind of gets everywhere. Um, and that's the grinding process. And then, you know, we've got like rinse tanks to do cleaning all this stuff, but those black mats like have a lot of schmutz in them, a lot of dust and all this little stuff. And uh, when Steven is in that all day and then he walks around, it can leave footprints everywhere. So we're trying to find a good way to not do that, to eliminate that. And right now he's got a two shoe system, so he's got his one pair of shoes here that is for this area and then he switches shoes and walks around but that's not super ideal either but we're trying to figure out you know good solution good figure good way to do it i did think about uh, is there a shop version of what do they call clogs those those like is that what they're called i don't know those big like rubber things that people wear on their feet all the time but that to go over a shoe so it's like a slipper it's like a work shoe slipper i don't know if that would be super annoying or not and now for 30 seconds of Epic Kern awesomeness. Okay, 45, I just couldn't stop myself. All right, we are done. I like my addition that I did after the fact of engraving the handle outline, just so you know which screw goes to which and where it goes to what, and that these two are for the clips. Otherwise, you just have a bunch of holes on the backside. You don't really know what's for what. Um, this just helps us see it a little bit so so I left a little skin on the bottom so when we flip it over that will get cut off but I was able to profile all the way around the outside to basically full depth like this skin is garbage it'll it'll go away on the, the facing off and then I was able to tip it and mill these slots from the side and chamfer it there's another slot over here this is what we use to grip onto it when we're pulling it off and it works really really well so now I'm gonna flip it over I'm gonna indicate it I'm gonna probe it on one of these holes because when you flip it, you don't know if it's like left or right. Um, for the roughing stock, I had enough clearance to, to deal with it, deal with a tiny bit of inaccuracy, but for the flip, I want it to be perfect. So I'm gonna probe off one of the holes, I'm gonna use a different fixture offset, because right now my fixture offset is in the center and way down here at the bottom of the Aroa palette. I've, I've decided <laughs> that uh, that's the best way for me. I've tried different ways. I've tried the top of the palette face, I've tried the vice, like, yeah, basic, basic origin, the one that never, ever, ever changes, the one that's consistent amongst the big pellets, the small pellets, all the pellets, and then everything else is stacked up in cam. Um, maybe I'll change that workflow over time, but that's, that's what I'm really liking right now. So essentially everything uses the exact same work coordinate as long as it's modeled properly in Fusion. And so far, it's working great.
3 d print something better than this. <laughs> you don't say. It worked until I touched it. <laughs> stay, stay. Stay. Stop going We got this, what, less than 10 minutes ago and we're already fixing it? We're experimenting. <laughs> we're voiding warranties here. That's all we're doing. Oh, oh. It does thread in. See, I don't like, I don't like this because it's got the rubber thingy and it spins and that's a problem. Yeah. But I think if my theory is right, we get rid of this thing, because I don't need this to be quick release. Thread it directly. They look the same threads. You thread it directly and then I can crank on it and like Loctite it and make it look at that it threads. Okay, make that rigid and then I'm much, much, much happier. Ooh, I like this. So this was like a cheap New Year one on Amazon. Um, there it is. It's like what, 40 bucks or something? Yeah, 40 to 60 depending yeah. on the size. Okay, I will button that up. Oh, you're on it. <laughs> Quick connect. Disconnect me. And then Fraser got me this guy. What's this called? The pixie stick? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> That's what I call it. I think <laughs> it's actually called the pixie. Okay. So it's uh, to replace the or the gorilla. Uh, I put it over there. So I've been using this guy for a long time, except I've already got some modifications to it. It's it's dead. It's bendy. And I don't actually use it for what it's meant to be used for, like grabbing a rep. <laughs> grabbing around an object or like you know a tree branch or something most of the time I just I grab it or I set it down and then I look and then I grab and I think and Fraser suggested that this thing will be better for me um, you push the button and you can articulate it like that he put a quick release uh, plate mount on it so that we can switch between this and a tripod and the this thing put the same plate mount on here so he's like buy two of those buy one plate to go on the bottom of the camera by this, by this, and then we're done. And that was like you know, 100 bucks or something for, for yeah, everything, maybe. Yeah. This was not that expensive. That's $25. 25 bucks for this is ridiculous. This is really good. It's really nice, too. One thing I noticed, all you machinists out there, uh, where's my... So this is our Noga magnetic base. Uh, every machinist basically uses one of these. We've got our indicator on it. And it's got a magnet inside that lifts up so you can attach it to an object and now measure something. So we use these all the time. And they have a very similar um, articulating mechanism. Except the camera style has these little gripper teeth on the inside to add more torsional leverage or, or uh, rigidity because the cameras are heavy and indicators are not. So that just kind of surprises me a little bit, but it makes sense. I just didn't expect it. So with a more rigid connection here, we clamp on an object. You got your grippies. Should be good. I was just thinking, it's it's nice to have my cameraman back. I mean, he's been here like forever. I've just been vlogging, been doing it myself. Um, so the air conditioning. Let's come see. Look at the size of this thing. I don't know what the plan is. Obviously, they gotta button up the window a little bit. Um, but the, the guy came by today and we're like, okay, so what's left? When can we turn it on? And he's like, I could probably turn it on today. And I was like, oh yeah. So if he can do that, then we'll film that and it'll be cool. I'm sweating already. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to be back in front of the camera. Uh, or behind the camera, I guess. I don't know. It's only just John. But uh, I haven't filmed anything here in like, while I've just been editing and doing all like website stuff but like it's good I like it so this is the old fixture uh, when I made it I talked that I wasn't happy about the finish because I used a bullnose end mill to do that facing pass and then this time I used a square end mill and got a way better surface finish it's a little draggy but it's really smooth and really beautiful so yeah, this is now garbage. Um, you can see the top side. I still have to do these operations to the top side, but that's what I'm doing next. 
So the critical test right now is to see if my precision locating bores on the corners will fit on the pallet. I think they're perfect. Beautiful. And if you're wondering what all the yellow stuff is, that's we had some resonating vibrating issues with this, so we filled it with two-part epoxy, like a lot of it, like two hundred dollars worth, <laughs> and uh, it sort of helped. But next tombstone is going to be designed a little bit differently, and uh, should be a lot better. I think we have this mount figured out, uh, and then I got the quick release on the bottom of the camera, so it just go like this, and then like that, and then, and then I can open the door, and you get this pan out, yeah, should be good. So this thing's probably just going to live there for a while, we'll see what it looks like. And then uh, Fraser and I were just talking about a crazy idea over here on the door. If if we mount another one right here, like let's let's pretend that I'm mounted or actually out a little bit. No, I'll just mount it right here. And then when the door opens, it angles like this. How would that look in slow mo? Good lens. Because the way the uh, the way the handle goes. Look at this guy, he's so excited. <laughs> I think something's happening with the AC. The days of sweating in the shop are soon to be over. This thing's turning on. Look at that, that's a beast. Look at how big this is. This is huge. I think it feels windy. I think he's turning it on. Yeah, it's it's definitely windier. <laughs> Just got these uh, laser guns. We've had one for a long time, but these new ones are pretty sweet. Now we have more. Yeah, 110 inside here. 114, 115, 100 and where'd that go? I thought I saw 120. That's hot. For all you Celsius people, that's hot. That's 47 degrees inside the Swiss when it's running. What about just the, the oil in the sump itself is 49. Oh, that's so hot. It's toasty, whereas the ground is 86 and the ceiling is 89. 31 and 30. So this is a good before and after for the AC actually. Okay, let's go let's go Fahrenheit. 86. The machines are 86. So it is still 85 degrees in here, but it's feeling much, much better. Much better. 
There it is running away. And uh, down here is where all of the shop's humidity is going. Yeah, it feels so much better in the shop. Man, this thing's a beast. Look at this, ducting. Today's been a really good day. We have air conditioning. I've been running the current quite a bit. I've got a few hours on it already. I'm doing a part that's gonna be 50 minutes right now, 5-0. Uh, the Mori's been running all day. It's gonna run all night. The Swiss has been running all day. It's gonna run all night. If I time it just right, depends on how one of the tools will last. Um, I should be able to have it still running when I come in in the morning. And the Nakamura is off now, but it was running all day. Uh, just on a one by one part, so we can't run it overnight yet. And the tech inspector is coming by tomorrow to uh, assess the two UMAC machines and, uh, and tell us what's wrong with them. So he's going to do his full inspection, and yeah, things are good. Man, the day when we're going to have all six machines running at the same time is going to be nuts. I mean, even just today, having four running at the same time has been very, very good. Makes you feel good. I got the 3D printer running too. Everything's running, almost everything's running. Anyway guys, I'm gonna cut it here and uh, I will see you guys in the next one.